All right, here we go. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming to the Center for the Art and Wood and uh, First Friday in the Woodshed. Um, the, if you're new to the program of Object Lesson, it's our monthly salon series, which um, essentially involves a deep dive into the Center's permanent collection. The permanent collection of the Center for Art and Wood has been painstakingly developed and stewarded over, uh, over 30 years of the Center's existence and now numbers uh, well over 1,100, closer to 1,200 um, artworks and objects of all disciplines, all relating to processes um, and materials of wood. And um, I encourage you to come by. The center is actually open Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, but you can also meet us here in the virtual space that we call the woodshed. And I hope you're all safe and well tonight. Um, before I introduce our object lesson speaker, I'm gonna kick us off with a first Friday cocktail that was actually inspired by um, Sam Davis and his um, object, the object he selected to speak with us about tonight. And um, so I'm just gonna take you through it. It's a pretty basic, simple cocktail process um, and recipe. And it's actually one of my favorites um, from uh, old time cocktail, um, pre-prohibition times. Um, so this cocktail I'm calling the um, the Clover Club with Extra John, and that's John John, J-A-W-N. My accent is probably way off. Um, but the reason um, I decided to visit the Clover Club cocktail tonight is because um, this week I've been thinking extra um, sentimentally about Philadelphia and how great the city is. And, um, and also in line with Sam's talk, he's gonna focus on some some ecology and ecological um, analyzing of artworks. And um, so I decided to go not only local with the Clover Club, but also vegan. Um, so I actually didn't know that the Clover Club cocktail originated in Philadelphia um, until really, really recently. Um, and it's actually dated around 1896, 1800. There were a group of journalists um, who formed a men's club. And these gentlemen would gather uh, at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel, which I believe is now a Hyatt on Broad Street, um, to, they would gather to drink and trade stories and talk about the trade gossip um, nightly. And, um, and they had a motto, who enters here leaves care behind, leaves sorrow behind, leaves petty envies and jealousies behind. Why we live in clover, why we live, we live in clover. When we die, we die all over. So with that, I thought we might celebrate this city tonight on October's first Friday with this twist on the signature drink of the city. Um, this twist is gonna offer a little bit of a different variation. First of all, it's vegan, as I mentioned, so that raw egg is gonna be switched out with um, something non-dairy. And then secondarily, I mentioned it has extra John. And like the word says, your John is your John, so whatever your John might be, um, put it in there. I went for sage um, because my plant is doing really well after this summer. Um, and uh, some peri peri bitters, because a little kick is my John. So I'm gonna take you through it now, get ready. First, you're gonna get your um, mixing cup and um, you're gonna drop in a couple of sage leaves. Um, so we'll just get a really, really nice light fragrance of sage throughout the drink. Um, and if you were here some point in the summer, um, I talked about cocktail muddlers and their tradition as material objects in bar culture and the material of wood. Um, so revisit that for some good techniques with the muddling stick. Um, so we're just gonna, I have my sage in here and I'm just gonna just give it a couple of spins with the muddling stick, just a little bit, not overdoing it because we don't want it to be too bitter. Um, okay, now I'm gonna put in my ingredients I'm gonna start with a local gin. Um, I've made a recommendation of the Liberty Gin, which is produced locally by the Palmer's Distillery, um, or Blue Coat, which is not really a London dry gin, it's an American dry gin, but it, it should be okay if that's how you like it. 
because this is your gen, right? Um, so I'm going to put two, uh, one and a half ounces of gin. And then I'm going to switch my, um, my shot over and I'm going to put about a half um, an ounce of Chambord, which is a raspberry liqueur. Um, in my glass, you can also use grenadine, which is a non-alcoholic cherry flavored syrup. I'm going to toss in another half ounce of uh, lemon juice. And um, I decided to go with coconut milk because it emulsifies really well with the rest of the drink. Sometimes your non-dairy drinks don't do that well with, um, with acids like lemon juice, but it all tastes good, so it's whatever you're John. Um, so I'm going to put another just a half ounce to give it some creaminess. Toss that in. Also, uh, what I noticed with coconut milk is that it foams up really well. And that's what we're really going for is some kind of um, recreation of the phenomena of adding a raw egg to the drink. So now that we have all of our ingredients in the cup, I'm going to add my ice. I never do ice before adding the um, ingredients because I don't like diluted uh, drinks. So this way the ice goes in really, really fresh, um, not diluted, and I'm going to give it a few shakes. So it gets nice, the sage um, gets all mixed in here and it gets all chilled. Just get a couple more for good luck. Open that up, uh, strain it into a glass. Um, I usually, when I'm doing this kind of drink, I usually put it in my um, coupe glasses. And um, what you'll get is a really, really beautiful rose color. And then I garnish it with a fresh sage leaf. Um, and here you go. So that's the Clover Club Vegan Style Extra John. Um, drink up. <laughs> and now I'm going to introduce uh, you to our feature object lesson speaker tonight. We are extra excited because um, tonight's speaker is actually one of the center's own family. Sam Davis, um, who is a guest services representative at the center and also social media coordinator, he's going to be speaking with you tonight about a select object in the collection. You're going to get an insider's view. So we're super excited and thank you so much, Sam. A little background about Sam. He's currently at the very end of his um, undergraduate studies in art history at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. He's a native Philadelphian um, and he grew up going to First Friday events with his family. Um, I met his father today at the center. That was really cool. Um, and um, he can usually be found uh, behind the front desk of the center, um, protected by our acrylic shield for um, pandemic times. Um, and he can also be found giving gallery tours or leading events um, and just welcoming you and talking to you all about the center, everything you need to know. He's also the auteur behind the beautiful social media content that we have going up now. Beautiful and witty, I should add. This past school year, Sam has completed his thesis addressing art history and the importance of eco-critical art theory with an accompanying ecological analyst, analysis of William Eggleston's uh, photography works. In the future, he hopes to help bring art and art history out of academia in order to make the arts more accessible for everyone. And in line with that thinking, I am going to give you Sam Davis. Sam, you're going to take it away. Hi. Thank you so much, Nava. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm super excited to be here. This is really cool. Like Nava said, I grew up going to First Fridays, and it's really fun and cool to be on the other side of them now uh, in this little presentation. So I hope you enjoy it. Let me just share my screen really quickly. All right, how does it look? Is it loading? 
Looks look good? All right, cool. So I'm Sam. We're going to be talking about eco-criticism, which is when you look at and interpret art through its ecological factors. And like Nava said, I'm an art history student, and I found that uh, throughout my time as an art history student that there's some misconceptions and some, some just general misunderstandings about what uh, art history studies mean and what it means for me to be a student of art history. A lot of people when I tell them that I'm an art history student they'll think of an image like this or people that dress like this. That's a pretty fly outfit but I don't know if I could pull it off. And they think that uh, I sort of just have this understanding of artwork that I don't really have. Or even some people think that my opinion about artwork is somehow going to be more valid or um, it trumps their opinion and that's just not true. Really what art history is, is learning how to analyze artwork from a very specific Western tradition um, analysis. So you start off by learning how to look at artwork and identify the historical context of an art piece, the subject being depicted and the style that it's depicted in. And then as you go further along in your education, you start to read art theory. This guy up in the top left is Heinrich Wolflin. He is really important because he sort of introduced the idea of looking at art for its formal prospects and its formal con components. So he would look at the perspectives of an artwork or how uh, subjects are positioned, what's around them, what's behind them, um, the architecture depicted and how it relates to the subjects within an art piece. He's really boring. I really do not like reading his work, so I wouldn't recommend reading his books unless you're really interested in uh, formal analysis, but he's important, so you have to read him. There's also some more old guard stuff, like there's a lot of Marxist theory, which is cool and really interesting because art um, is right now and historically has been used by the wealthy to uh, promote their own wealth. So looking at class divides within artwork is really interesting and cool. Um, but it's a very established field and uh, there's a lot of Marxist art theory that's been written. Then there's also, of course, Freudian stuff, looking at uh, art with a psychoanalytical lens, um, trying to deduce what the artist's childhood was like based on their depictions of a piece of fruit or something like that. Stuff that, uh, that's kind of what you tend to think of when you think of like a, a stereotypical art historian looking at an artwork. Um, I kind of take all that with a grain of salt, but it's still interesting and worth looking into. And then you get into the stuff that I think is way more interesting and uh, worth reading. So up here, this is Linda Nochlin. She is a key feminist art historian. I would totally recommend looking her up. That's Linda, L-I-N-D-A, Nochlin, N-O-C-H-L-I-N. She wrote this really cool, uh, it's an article, but it's also sort of an art piece in and of itself called Why Are There No Great Women Artists? Um, and that sort of challenges the art historical canon and the study of the Western art historical canon um, to ask why don't we consider any women artists to be great artists like we do Michelangelo or Leonardo. There's also people like the Gorilla Girls who um, challenge institutional racism and sexism and promote um, intersectionality within art spaces. So you'll see their artwork and their writings in places like the Met or the MoMA. Um, they're based out of New York, so they mainly challenge institutions there, but their activities over the past 30 or 40 years are really cool and really important to our study and our understanding of art um, today and uh, historic, the history of art as well. And then on the bottom, this is Bell Hooks. She's really, really cool. She um, was really integral to the idea of intersectionality within cultural criticism, not just art theory and art criticism. Um, and so you sort of, through reading art theory, you try to get an understanding of art from multiple angles and you try to learn how to analyze and interpret art from different um, ideological components and perspectives. And then 
more recently, there's been, sorry, ecological art theory, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. And ecological art theory or eco-criticism is really cool because it has its roots in all of those different theories um, that I just mentioned. So all of those different ideological theories have ecological components and understanding eco-criticism can help you better understand those ideological theories as well. So eco-criticism uh, has its roots in ecology and which has its roots in environmentalism. And we know that um, environmentalism is as old as time. The Native Americans had very, very um, important and uh, time-tested environmental methods, environmentalist methods. Um, a lot of cultures throughout the Americas and Southeast Asia um, and Africa have practiced environmentalism forever, but because I'm speaking from an, uh, a Western perspective um, and I'm talking about westernized eco-critical theory, uh, the history of that is really rooted in um, environment or westernized environmentalism and westernized eco-critical theory. So, Eco-critical comes from the word ecological, and ecology was a phrase coined by this guy, Ernst Haeckel. Um, he was a German biologist and ecologist uh, in the mid to late 1800s. And what's cool about him is he was also an artist. So this is a drawing of his. He would go out into the field and draw the different things that he saw and studied. So this, I believe, is um, sea anemones and maybe a barnacle down at the bottom. I really love his artwork. Um, his writing is a bit dry because it's pretty scientific, but ecology is coined in his book, General Morphologie der Organismen, uh, where he defined the term ecology as the body of knowledge concerning the economy of nature, the study of all those complex interrelations Darwin called the struggle for existence. So basically, Ecology is just the interaction between the different components of any given environment. And this new way of thinking about the environment through ecological reasoning came about at the beginning of the Anthropocene, which is our current epoch or our current era of time uh, that's defined by human interaction and human dominance over the environment. So basically, since the mid to late 1800s, the amount of industry and pollution that we've um, put into the world has really changed our environment uh, at a level where we see it on a global scale and we can't deny that our impact on the environment has like defined our age and our environmental age. And so since this new understanding of our own environmental age. There's been a really cool environmentalist movement. You'll probably recognize all of these people. Um, labor organizers, politicians, people who have um, used their celebrity to promote environmentalism, and also artists like Ansel Adams who use their work to promote environmentalism. And out of that came eco-criticism. So this is Alan Braddock. He's kind of like the father of modern eco-criticism. He taught at Tyler for a while, but now he works at William & Mary. And uh, so when I wrote my thesis about eco-critical art theory, I quoted him heavily. He's a really interesting dude. And from what I've heard, he's really down to earth and really open. So if you ever get a chance to meet him, tell him I said, hey. And like Nava mentioned, I wrote my thesis about William Eggleston's photography. And I took an eco-critical viewpoint uh, what I wrote about specifically was the, um, the fact that Eggleston, I'm trying to think about how to say this in a nutshell. Eggleston is a really important photographer because he was the first recognized art photographer to use color. Before that, it, you would traditionally shoot in black and white, and that was seen as a real art form, and color photography was just a gimmick put out by Polaroid. But then Eggleston came along and he was using um, disposable and everyday cameras to capture really artistically beautiful photographs. And so he was the first color photographer to have his work put in 
the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and he was the first to really be recognized as a photographer, as an artist photographer using color. And another thing about him is that he's really mysterious um, and annoyingly, he doesn't like to talk about the meanings of his photographs or the motivations behind why he shoots what he shoots. So all of the scholarship about his photography focuses on the mystery of William Eggleston. Um, if you Google his name, you're gonna see the mystery, the deep dark uh, essence, the mist that takes over his photos. There was a show of his work at the University of Missouri called um, The Mystery. I'm sorry, we have some dirt bikes outside. Hope that didn't interrupt. Um, there's uh, a show at the University of Mississippi that was called The Mystery of Eggleston and a whole book put out all about the mystery. And the viewpoint I took in my thesis was that if you look at his work eco-critically uh, and you dissect the pollution and the consumption present in his photos, you can start to take away from the mystery. So like in this photo, uh, en route to New Orleans, it's really beautiful photo, really eye-catching and something that like you would see in a museum, but it's depicting the use of a disposable plastic item. So I looked into what kind of plastic that is. It's a peat plastic. It's gonna last for 500 years. And when it degrades, it's not gonna fully degrade. It's just gonna break down into smaller plastic pellets, which are gonna further pollute the environment. And then this picture, which is literally of just garbage, shows a whole hodgepodge of things that are gonna last forever. And so my viewpoint was that through understanding that his work is depicting um, the Anthropocene, it's depicting how we are polluting our own environment, you start to realize that like the mystery and the, the creepiness of his photos is really just us realizing that we are leaving our mark and not in a really great way. I also more locally have written about um, the Wissahickon Trail. This is uh, the toleration statue, which you can hike to off of the kitchen lane trailhead, Kitchens Lane Trailhead in Mount Airy. It's a really fun short hike. I would totally recommend it if you can do it. Um, and it sits atop a rock outcropping called Old Mom Rinker's Rock, kind of a tongue twister name. But the deal with this rock is that this woman, Old Mom Rinker, who is from a pretty well-established Philadelphia family, would sit atop this rock every Saturday morning and she would knit that was her tradition. And like I said, she came from an established family. Her family owned an, a pub, I believe, in Germantown that George Washington would go to regularly. So her family kind of got in with the Revolutionary Armed Forces during the Revolutionary War. And uh, she became a spy for Washington. And she would sit atop this rock and, knit and look at what the British were doing in the Wissahickon Park and she would take note of what they were doing, write it down on a piece of paper, put the paper into a ball of yarn, and then throw it down to other spies who were at the bottom of the rock. So it was this really cool example of how this uh, nature area in Philadelphia is intertwined with a really important historical moment, but also a really cool uh, weaving, that's a good pun, of how craft fit into that moment. She was using knitting to spy and uh, get away with looking at what the British were doing. And so it has art historical influence and environmental uh, historical influence as well. So I wrote about how that's important to um, art history and environmental history within our own local area. So what does this have to do with the Center for Art and Wood? Well, woodwork is inherently um, eco-critical. It has a direct environmental implication. And I think that it's really worth noting that we're not the only animals that work with wood. So this was uh, in 2019, a British spy camera caught this, hut. this female orangutan sawing a branch and she hadn't learned, she hadn't been taught how to saw. She just figured it out how to do it on, totally on her own which is Somehow, pretty amazing. She is working, um, I posted this on it. our Instagram and it kind of blew up. It was really fun to see. I also just love orangutans like and I love this video. Orangutans it's like mesmerizing watching them work. To grasp and handle objects with precision. 
She like holds on to the branch <laughs> and just- 20 years ago. You, it's crazy, I can't believe it. Anyway, look this up, totally worth watching. Um, so like I said, woodcraft has direct ecological implications. And one thing that's really cool about wood is that it has its own historical markers. So we all learned in elementary school that the rings of a tree are how old it is, but there's a lot more. You can see forest fire scarring. You can see, um, depending on how big the size of the ring is, how dry or how wet that year was, how much rain it got, you can pretty much tell what that tree has been through, the history of the tree, when you cut it down and look at it. So woodworkers have to reckon with the history of the tree in making their, their woodwork. We sell a lot of bowls. My job is in the store at the Center for Art and Wood. We sell a lot of bowls that are made of burls, which is, that's when you see like a, a little growth or a big growth on the outside of a tree that doesn't look like it's supposed to be there. The woodworker who turns that bowl on a lathe has to recognize how old and how big that growth is. So they have to recognize the ecology of the wood that they're working with in order to make a sound product or art piece. This is George Nakashima. He was uh, probably, I mean, he's definitely one of the most important woodworkers of all time, probably one of the most famous of the 20th century. He made really, really amazing furniture, um, one of which is gonna be an auction piece and our fundraiser happening right now. And, or actually it's from his workshop, he didn't actually make it, but anyway, I had to plug that. Um, his famous quote is that there must be a union between the spirit and wood and the spirit and man. And this sort of represents the uh, across the board understanding among woodworkers that when you make an art object out of wood, you're providing a second life for the tree that you worked with. So you're recognizing the history of the tree, what the tree has been through in its own environment, and then you're making something out of that tree and uh, you're helping it grow even after it can't grow anymore. So I thought it would be cool and fun if I led you guys through an eco-critical analysis of an art object in our collection. This is what we're gonna be talking about. This is called Door, 8 July, Pine Street by Hartmut Rademann. And Hartmut is from Germany. Uh, this piece is in our collection because Hartmut was a resident in our ITE residency program last year, which if you don't know, we have an international residency program at the Center for Art and Wood. We have artists apply from all over the world to come and live together and work together and make together. And it's a really, really cool experience, not just for the artists, but for us at the Center for Art and Wood and for the public because we do a show at the end of the residency where they get to show what they've made throughout the residency. And one thing that Hartmut brought with him was this- it's seven o'clock. Excuse me, my computer tells me the time. I'm sorry, I forgot to turn that off. What Hartmut brought with him was this series he was doing called um, the Diary Series. Basically, he would take found branches and carve a diary entry into them every day. So if you can see in my little square, I have one of the pieces right here. Um, these are miniature carvings. They're really, really intricate, really hard to do on a green. That means like a, a not treated new found branch. Let me just pick it up. I gotta put my gloves on. So you can see how tiny and how delicate that carving is. Um, and he had a ton of these. He made one every single day throughout this summer long residency program. And he was making them before he came to the residency program and he's continued to make them afterwards. So this is just a thing he does for himself, but they're really beautiful and amazing art objects. And we also have one that he's done with a chainsaw. This is the thing that he does that is really cool and worth looking at. So some background on Hartmut, he's from Germany. He's from a part of Germany that is a heavy forest area. There's a rich tradition of woodworking in this area. And him personally, uh, the village that he grew up in had a wood shop and the woodworker was apparently this really cool, amazing dude. And he would have all of the local kids come in and hang out and learn how to use wood tools. So 
as Hartman told me, he got really good with a knife around seven or eight years old, which sounds terrifying, but it was really uh, great for him as an artist. And I guess that's part of why he was so dexterous and able to carve at such a miniature scale. But he has a rich background of woodworking that he brought to this residency program and that he brought to this diary series. So looking at this art object eco-critically, it's a found branch. It was found on Pine Street on July 8th. Um, if you've been to Pine Street in Philadelphia, it's a beautiful street. The sidewalks are brick. There's trees everywhere. So I'm not surprised that he found a really nice branch to carve on Pine Street. Um, and it's a door. So he's showing two figures walking through a doorway. I'm guessing that's something that happened today. I'm not, he kind of gave scant information about what the scenes actually depict. There was one of a, a letter carrier, another one of a guy sleeping on some stairs. They were all really interesting and mystical. Um, but this one specifically, so it's, a, it's found wood. We don't know exactly what type it is. And it's green. You can see that crack going, going down the middle. So it was really hard to carve on. Um, and the bark is still on it. So this is not only a reflection of the woods history, but it's a reflection of his experience that he's imposing onto the woods history. This was a branch that he found during his, re during his time as a resident in our residency program while he was walking around Philadelphia, a new place to him that he hadn't really lived in before. And he's using his own um, specialty of expression to carve his experience into this branch that he found. So it's sort of a, a melding of these two different experiences, one the experience of the tree and one the experience of the artist that it's coming together to make this really cool expression of a shared experience. And we know through the lectures that were done at this residency program that Hartman had clear ecological intent. So um, he talks about the information that's stored within the wood, how old it is, what weather was the tree exposed to, what has the tree overcome. And he tries to represent that in the carvings and the, the wood, the, the outcome of his woodworking. Um, and I also really love this quote because I think it speaks volumes about the diary piece, but also just woodworking in general. If you look at things microscopically, you'll find the same structures that you see in the universe. I think what he's getting at is that um, because woodworking has to grapple with the environmental history of a piece of wood. Um, it's really a representation of our environmental experience on earth just as much as it's a representation of the, the piece of wood's environmental experience. Um, he talked about this further uh, as like he's recognizing the ecological function of the living tree, talking about the branches are like the muscles that hold the tree together. Um, and how through exploring those branches, you can come to understand the tree and come to understand his work better. And this, as he says, was the whole inspiration for the Diary and Wood series. So I think that coming from an ecological standpoint and looking at this artwork in particular can really help us understand where the artist was coming from. We kind of lucked out that he has written primary source text of talking about the ecology of the wood that he's dealing with. But um, working to interpret and understand art from an ecological standpoint can really help us understand our experience in our environment. We talked about the Anthropocene. Would he have found this branch if we weren't in such an industrial age? Would Philadelphia be as industrialized? Would he have come to this residency program if we weren't in such a technological industrialized um, moment in history. We don't know, but this branch is a representation of a moment in that time. Um, and then he further worked to express a representation of that moment with his carvings. And I think that that's really cool and it can help us understand a lot about us just as much as it helps us understand about the artwork. So yeah, that's my presentation. I guess we can open it up to questions now. Thank you, Sam. That was so great.
um, a field that I have expanded even my own um, analysis in um, art historical um, examinations. Cool. So Thank that's you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I definitely encourage um, any questions. I know that Sam is excited to hear from you. Um, and so maybe we start by having you add them to the chat. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Sam, I was really struck by a couple of things that you mentioned. First of all, um, how much the impact um, on the environment throughout the Anthropocene age has um, defined our very existence. And then by extension, um, material culture, which defines us as humans. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Maybe you could unpack that, that sense of ambivalence that you ended on with um, describing that kind of occasion of Helmut being in Philadelphia and how if we hadn't on the one hand, um, it's, it's, it goes without question that humanity has exhausted a lot of devastation on the environment. But on the other hand, certain things wouldn't be allowed to happen if, if not for humankind. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's a really weird thing to grapple with right now because we're seeing like terrible environmental disasters happening right in front of us and you can start to feel kind of helpless. Um, but I think that through understanding uh, how like our, our, not only our lives, but our own history has been impacted by this huge environmental shift can help mm -hmm. us understand how to fix it and work to um, change our methods of environmental devastation. Um, and yeah, I mean, were you asking about, do you mean, do you want me to unpack like my feelings about the Anthropocene or like the the art object within the Anthropocene or? Yeah, more more the, the art object in the context of that era. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the fact that this is on a found branch speaks volumes about not just the this specific art piece, but like where we are um, in the history of art. We just started the residency program at the Center for Art and Wood. It's a winter residency program we're doing with a, um, a local maker studio in Philadelphia called NextFab. And one of the requirements of the residency program is that 50% of what you make has to be done through reclaimed wood. And we probably wouldn't be doing that if there wasn't a ton of environmental devastation going on. And we felt the need to have that as one of the specifications. I think that like, um, you look at contemporary art and a lot of it is grappling with these environmental issues and using environmentally sound materials to make artwork. We had Erez Nebipana as an artist not too long ago who is a vegan artist and all of his uh, materials for his artwork is um, environmentally sourced and it's uh, not gonna have lasting, his art objects aren't gonna have lasting ecological impact. Um, and I think it's really important to at least have an inkling of understanding about climate change and the state of it today in order to understand artwork today, art that's coming out today. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's really, I think eco-critical art theory is coming to a point where it's going to be required in order to understand any artwork. Um, you need to have, like I mentioned earlier, it has, it's connected to all of those different facets of art theory, but really any art object ever created ever has ecological impact. Any artifact that's dug up at uh, an ancient site or things that are being made today, it has environmental impact and it has ecological implications. And so um, learning to interpret things for their materiality and their environmental impact, I think is growing in importance. And I mean, I wish I learned about it earlier in school, honestly. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. That I, I, I agree that there is a long future ahead of you here. Um, 
and I'm sure you're going to make your mark. And I'm so thrilled that you're at the Center for Art in Wood because um, artists who work in wood are, are by definition um, uniquely connected to issues of conservation and observances of shifts in the environment or in the climate um, because they work with a material that documents all of that in its grains. And um, so it's impossible to ignore it because it is visibly available to them as material, as source material. So um, this is the right place for you to be with this line of inquiry. Um, so I'm really excited. I will say that um, uh, wood turners and many artists working in the material of wood tend to, by definition, um, look uh, source their, their material in um, scrap wood or in small bits of wood and often felled, more often than not actually, felled trees um, unless they're working in exotic woods, but you see less of that now because of the, um, the consciousness that's been raised about that. So there is movement, particularly among artists working in wood who, who may actually be leading um, a movement to, to um, shift thinking about art making um, and material responsibility. Um, so we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna, th I'm gonna start at the top. Um, so the first one is from Dan Reich. Um, he asks, what was the most impactful thing you learned while you were researching for your thesis? Oh man. Uh, you know, um, I got really, like I said, I, uh, I looked at the environmental impact of his photography, not only in what he depicted, but in the photographs themselves and learning just how ingrained climate devastation is in our everyday lives was like pretty breathtaking. Um, I researched specifically the Kodak plant in Rochester, New York. Mm -hmm. um, and so throughout the 20th century, um, especially in the early part of the 20th century, you wouldn't go to CVS to get your photos developed. You would send your film in a film envelope to the Kodak plant. They would develop them for you and then send them back. Uh, and as a result of this crazy industrial chemical photo development process, that zip code in Rochester has like uh, some of the most toxic groundwater in the world and like crazy terrible cancer rates in that area of Rochester. The Kodak company led um, the world in chemical pollution just from that plant like for 20 years until they fell apart in 2008. And they developed their own subsidiary chemical company, which is still operating today and still polluting in rivers all over the country today because they realized that they could save money by developing their own chemicals. They also had their own gelatin plant at this Kodak facility in Rochester where they developed the gelatin, which if you don't know is animal bones that are boiled down, which has crazy environmental impact because of factory farming, which is devastating, it uses about 10% of the world's water, clean water source. Um, and so they- Source of methane, yes. Yeah, it's like, just like seeing how interconnected our methods of environmental devastation are and seeing how ingrained they are and just like taking a photo as environmental impact, even on your phone. Like, um, I know that film isn't as popular as it once was. Taking a photo on your phone has environmental impact because the photo is being stored. Um, if you put it on Instagram, the Instagram servers are using coal energy. Like just like, it almost made me feel hopeless just like realizing that like, yeah, we're fucked. Like there's like, there's just a crazy, crazy amount of environmental devastation happening that like if we don't do something soon, it's going to be really bad. And we're already seeing across the world that like what's happening. It's what's happening right now as a result of that. And uh, so, yeah, sorry to kind of go off on a tangent there. But yeah, that was uh, really, really crazy to realize in the middle of quarantine while I was writing my thesis sitting at the dining table. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. It is, it is incredibly urgent. So um, your passion matches the urgency. And uh, that's the only way we're going to get things um, done here. Um, let's see, Aiden Rogers 
right um oh <laughs> and then you answered the question ahead of the question being asked um or ahead of us getting to the question so he asked if woodworking is inherently as unsustainable but maybe you have thoughts about that um separate from what was already said ah uh, that's a really good question i think that like um if you're not connected to the wood world which most people aren't you wouldn't really realize what nava just said is that most of these artists are uh, environmentally conscious, they're sourcing wood from already felled trees, or they're using small pieces. Like there's a growing movement to be environmentally conscious about your wood turning. Um, but I think through that, there's a way for woodworking to be the opposite of environmentally constructive. I think that like Nakashima said, giving these trees a second life and um, working to make beautiful and thought-provoking things out of this reclaimed wood that would have just gone to waste otherwise is a really cool way to kind of like mitigate this environmental destruction. Um, so yeah, I think that that's definitely something that like I think about here and that I know a ton of woodworkers think about every day when they're working. It's true. Um, are you aware of any woodworking artists who use the roots of trees as their material? The roots? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Hartmut Rodeman did, right? Back in Germany. All yeah. the parts, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Hartmut is part of a group of artists in Germany um, who they kind of work together to tackle different projects. And one of them was working with the roots of a tree. Uh, I wish I had some photos right now to pull up of that. But yeah, that would totally be worth looking into. Yeah. Do you know anyone, Nava? Off the top of my head, no. I mean, I was trying to think. Um, there are a lot of artists who, who especially in the UK, who um, kind of coax um, living trees into sculptural forms and also functional furniture forms as they're living, and then they continue to grow in this kind of cultured way. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but roots, not immediately. I know that there are. It's a, it's a tricky material, but woodworkers tend to gravitate towards tricky and challenging materials by definition. Um, let's see, has the way you've t interacted with your environment um, and living materials in art objects uh, changed as you've researched ecological art history and art theory? Um. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, definitely. Just the way, I'm sorry, I was looking at Derek Bencomo's yeah, comment. I, yes, I just saw that. Yeah. Oh, of we'll course. In the chat right now, um, I would definitely look up his work and see if any of his pictures of the things he does with fruits is online. Derek, if you have a link of that, I would definitely put that in the chat. Um, but yeah, uh, like my interpretation of materiality in general like outside of artwork has like totally totally changed just from like learning about eco-criticism and starting to think with an environmental mindset um the <laughs> intro paragraph of my thesis was just it was sort of a it was a list of all of the disposable products that i use throughout a week so like i go to work and i have a cup of coffee and then i go to a party and i drink out of a solo cup and i um i get takeout because i don't feel like doing dishes and like i i think that like it's like if you can't like it like it's like irresponsible to not think about how you to not rethink about how you use materials after studying environmental theory in general and ecological theory not just art historical environmental theory Definitely. Okay, so we're getting a lot of um, reminders of artists who work in Ruth, so um, they're everywhere. Um, Dave Leader is here, um, volunteer with the center, and um, he and his wife Carol are wood turners, and Dave works with Ruth. So um, also we had a lecture with my friend Dania Chanminski, who's a contemporary jeweler, um, and the earlier, the really early in the summer, um, and she of course has done extensive work um, with with um, roots and various parts of the tree. So 
they're everywhere. Um, next question. Um, let's see, I'm missing, oh, here we go. Um, Lucas Kresmian is asking uh, what your thoughts on the wood or, or the thoughts of the wood uh, working community as a whole's view of the intentional artistic manipulation of living trees like the practice of maintaining bonsai trees and shrubs or probably what I mentioned um, earlier about, about the cultivating of shapes um, in sculptural forms of living trees. Um, what, to what degree are these practices in woodworking connected conceptually or historically through artists that may have done both? Um, I am not too well read on that practice. I do know that uh, it has a really rich history. So mm -hmm. Native Americans um, would, uh, they would, I forget what the term is, but they would manipulate the growth of trees to signify paths through a forest. And those trees are still alive today. You can go and see them. There's some in Virginia, I believe, and in different parts of the Carolinas. Um, and I think that these practices of manipulating trees and tree growth have really important cultural significance, talking about things like bonsai trees and the history of bonsai trees. Uh, so, um, I mean, I think it depends on the woodworker if you ask if these methods are woodworking. Uh, I don't feel really qualified to say whether or not they are. Um, I think they're like definitely connected to woodworking, but they're not like the same thing as turning a stump on a lathe or carving. Um, and you said, yeah, I mean, I think it's a cool tradition. I think it's uh, worth reading more about. I wish I had a like a repertoire in my brain of information about it. But yeah, I think that's a really cool thing to to read about and learn the significance of. I'd also mention the Bodgers, um, which is really um, an ancient tradition of wood turning where they actually set up in the forest um, a lathe and, and are there working and it's taking green working to another level where they're actually working on site where the tree is located. Um, so process and place are married in that, um, in that scenario, which is still being researched and practiced by a very few people in the UK and then a couple of people in the US as well, um, which is definitely deserving of much more study. Um, we have another question. Um, Leo Figueroa, if I'm saying that right, as a native Philadelphian as part of the Center for Art and Wood family, how would you rate the sustainability of your workplace? Um, and are there specific sustainability initiatives that the Center for Arted Wood is championing? Um, and I definitely think that um, I, if I can just step in and answer, we, we did talk about the new uh, launch of the winter residency in partnership with Nextpad, which, which encourages artists to think about sustainability um, by, use, by demanding, putting a constraint on their work that they um, use uh, half, at least half of their materials in their artworks are going uh, to be sourced from reclaimed materials. Um, also, I would add that the, the residency itself, the, um, the Wingate residency, which takes place in the summers, um, has a partnership with uh, Fairmount Parks and Recreation, um, and uh, artists generally source almost all of their materials, if it's not material like Hartmut, for example, is taken from the street. Um, they source a lot, almost all of their um, hardwoods from uh, the wood recycling uh, yard. So, um, Sam, you can take it away. Yeah, I knew Leo was going to ask a hard question. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a really good question, um, especially after the talk that I just gave. But like Nava said, we're trying to um, we have this initiative going with the Rinter Residency Program. Also, on an administrative level, we're a fairly paperless office. Mm -hmm. Most of our um, files are put onto hard drives, and we have a drive that we all gather from. Um, and we work with local organizations and try to champion artists who are working environmentally uh, with environmental stability. 
just last week we talked with Robert Rising. He's a lumberyard or owner in New York, and what he does is he salvages fallen trees and um, reclaimed wood throughout Manhattan and the greater New York City area. And a lot of the artists that we work with get their wood supply from him. So um, we definitely try to promote this network of woodworkers and wood providers who work uh, under environmentally stable conditions. Thank you. Yeah, we try our best. Um, uh, there's a question from Joe Reich again, um, and this is a really good question as well. Um, outside of direct engagement with wood, are there other artists or other um, contemporary craft makers or designers who are um, working in other materials that are with a mind on sustainability that you are aware of? Yeah. Whom you've studied? I mean, it's like really a, like an art world cultural shift, um, especially as the world becomes more globalized. Um, you see ecologically minded artwork being made all around the world. Um, like I said earlier, we had an artist talk earlier this summer with Erez Nebipana. He's from Israel and um, he incorporates the Dead Sea into his artwork. So he would um, make a stool and then let it rest in the Dead Sea and let the salt accumulate onto the stool and then he would remove it and that would be part of the art installation was this salt encrusted stool. Um, there's also that artist, I'm forgetting his name, which is really bad. He takes, um, reclaim materials and almost makes textiles out of them. So he's made like tapestries out of bottle caps and um, candy bar wrappers. Do you know his name, Nava? Elan Etsui. Yeah, where's he from? Um, Ghana, I believe, if I'm not wrong, it's Ghana. Um, and he also works with communities um, mm -hmm. in terms of collection, the collecting of the materials and then also the assemblage of the pieces right. themselves. So there's a community aspect as well. Yeah, and I think that's really cool that he's using his, his prominence as an artist to help get community engagement and communities thinking with an ecological mindset. And it's coming about in his work, um, which his work is beautiful. You don't even, you don't realize that you're looking at garbage when you're looking at it. It's, he totally reworks and reorganizes and reforms his materials to make uh, a really amazing art object. Yeah, thanks. At this point, um, I would just encourage everyone to unmute themselves and open their videos to say hi to Sam. And if you have additional questions, I invite you to just blurt them out. Um, and um, in the meantime, I'm gonna say thank you so much, Sam. This has been so enlightening and so topical and timely and um, exactly what I needed to hear on the first Friday of this month um, at the end of this week. So I really thank you for your research and, um, and scholarship and attentiveness to, um, to the issues of our time and connecting them with art. Thank you so much, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Nava, thanks for the opportunity. And thanks for making the Center for Art and Wood a cool place to work, I really appreciate it. I know. All right, everyone. Good job, Sam. Yay. <laughs> Congratulations, Sam. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. It's good to see everyone. Um, uh, before, if, if there are no comments, um, we're at 7.30, so before we sign off, I just wanna encourage everyone to um, pay a visit to the center's website. We are um, currently in the midst of a fundraising campaign to help us get through um, this year and um, make up the gap that was caused by the necessary closures of the center um, and the loss of revenue that ensued. We are, we are so strong as a team and we are totally behind our mission, um, but we do need your help and your support. So thank you, first of all, for attending tonight. It means so much to see you here. And, um, and if you enjoyed tonight and you enjoyed the programs that the center is um, working on and producing, um, if any, every bit helps. So um, thank you so much.
And um, with that, I'm going to say good night and check in with us next first Friday, which is November, I want to say 6th. Um, and um, we'll see you then. Uh, we have a number of programs in the meantime. We have an opening of, um, of our 25th anniversary of our residency program we were discussing earlier. And we have a lot going on at the Center for Art and Wood in our virtual space as well as on our physical space. So come by, say hello, um, or stop by our virtual woodshed space. Have a great weekend and a great month and see you soon. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.